us a little bit, Paul, but I mean, this is this seems to be another concern about iron intake and iron uptake. Uh, I've looked at it, looked at hepcidin and, and its role as it's influenced by insulin. Have you seen any issues with iron overload? Uh, my thought is iron storage issues sort of run with metabolic uh, disease. And once that, once that clears up, we don't have iron issues. But what has been your experience with people on so high, high this, iron diets? So carnivore diet's a high iron diet, right? Potentially. So let's have a look at what most doctors look at to determine high levels of iron. It's called ferritin. So ferritin is a, is a molecule that stores iron inside it. And the big problem is that your storage level of iron doesn't reflect the iron that's available to your body. And as you know, with hepcidin and all these, uh, you know, regulation of ferroportin and these kind of things, you can have high levels of iron in the body that your body can't access. And to understand this, we need to understand a bit of evolutionary history. So we've evolved being exposed to infections. And the, a lot of these pathogens need iron to survive. So when we get an infection and our body's inflamed, Basically, the signal goes out to say, hey, let's lock our iron stores away. It makes it easiest for us to eradicate this pathogen. And that's a very sensible adaptive response. So you get an infection, you lock your iron stores away in ferritin. So any iron that's coming into your body is just being stuffed into ferritin. Your ferritin stores will increase in size, but the iron is not available to the pathogen. So your immune system can clear it easier. Um, but it's also important to note that when it's not available to the pathogen, it's also not available for your body. Now, if it's a short-lived infection, that's no problem. But what happens if you now have inflammation that's autoimmune in nature and is persistent months or years at a time? Well, the body perceives that as being an infection because it doesn't know how else to respond. So it responds by locking all the, all the iron that comes into your body gets stuffed into your ferritin stores. So your ferritin stores increase and increase and increase. Doctor does a blood test and says, oh, Sean, your ferritin level is huge. You've got heaps of iron. There's no problem at all. Well, we have this thing called anemia of chronic inflammation, which mimics iron deficiency anemia. And what that means is that you can have a massive level of iron, but you're, it's actually inaccessible to your body. So what we find is that when we deal with the inflammation, we have to deal with the autoimmune disease. And we deal with, cause that's usually what's causing it. We deal with the inflammation, then the iron actually gets released from the iron stores and your body can start to use it as normal. So your ferritin stores will then actually go down, but at the same time your ferritin stores are going down, your iron availability is increasing because it's now available for use. So let's have a think about how iron is used in the body. So iron is used in cytochrome enzymes necessary for production of energy. So if you're deficient in iron, and that can either be this um, secondary inflammation, what we call a functional iron deficiency, or it could be an absolute iron deficiency. Say for instance, you have a, a female who's had heavy periods and a couple of children and uh, you know, uh, uh, these kind of things that you lose iron in all of those. Then your energy expenditure pathways are impaired. And they've done studies in females who have been iron deficient where they've actually measured their body weight and their fat mass, et cetera, et cetera. And then they've given them iron infusions and they haven't done any other intervention and they've lost weight and their energy expenditure has increased. So deficiency of iron, either functional or absolute, will impair your weight loss. And then we come to the mental effects. And this is something that most people do not understand is that iron is necessary for synthesis of neurotransmitters, the currency of the brain. So dopamine, which makes you feel good, serotonin, noradrenaline, these all require iron to be synthesized. So if you're chronically inflamed and your body can't access with iron, you actually end up deficient in neurotransmitters. And as you know, people who are in chronic inflamed state or iron deficient state come in with depression and anxiety. So what's happening is these chemicals that they need to function normally in their brain to make them feel good, they're feeling like they're just living in a gray veil. So what do they do? So the dopamine is essential. It's in what we call the mesolimbic pathway. It gets released and we feel good, we get reward. And if you're deficient in dopamine, as you are on an iron deficient diet, well, you say, well, look, this is crap. I don't like existing like this. If I eat something sweet, that's going to squeeze out the last vestige of dopamine and it's going to give me a transient release from this depression that I'm feeling. So this ends up driving people towards self-medicating with sweet foods and they, 
they'll crave, they'll binge eat, they'll respond. And that's a perfectly reasonable response in their situation. Their situation being that they're feeling depressed, they're feeling sad, their neurotransmitters are deficient. And this is a way of partially taking away that feeling for a short period of time. So what we find is that when we take away the inflammation and we see their C-reactive protein and their erythrocyte sedimentation rate and these other markers come down and these acute phase proteins, people will come in and they'll say, number one, I feel better. And number two, I have no cravings. And you probably know better than I do the amount of people who will come in and say, I've started the carnivore diet and I no longer have any cravings. And that's the mechanism. It actually comes back down to this release of iron. And while the iron stores might look like they're actually lower in the body, the utilization of the iron is actually better. And just to, I guess, address your question more pointedly at the start about what happens to iron on a carnivore diet, I've had several patients who have been heterozygous um, for some hemochromatosis genes. And usually, because we address the inflammation, their ferritin stores will actually fall, not increase on a carnivore diet. Yeah, that's what I've seen. I've, I've seen people with, you know, ferritins of 2000 plus, which is, you know, huge, go and needing, you know, biweekly blood draws uh, to go from to that to a normal ferritin level with no, no more blood draws, which I think and, and eating way more heme iron than, than obviously the doctors. Tell and, what, and now you're that. and the understanding is as it's an inflammatory response. So you're dealing with the inflammation, which is a trigger for the iron stores or the ferritin to increase. Now, there is actually a key point with hemochromatosis that is actually important that it, as a genetic condition, it is associated with hypertriglyceridemia, high triglyceride levels, and it's also associated with oxidized LDL levels. So when we do this uh, lipid electrophoresis on the LDL subfraction, um, people with hemochromatosis, this extra iron that they have going around can actually contribute to increased oxidative stress. And there's some early studies, mainly in animals, looking at antioxidants like N-acetylcysteine and melatonin and the impact that that can have on reducing the oxidative stress that is inherently associated with hemochromatosis. But it's certainly interesting to note that this group of people actually have a, a distinct lipid profile compared to the rest of the population.